Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and as it's Thursday I'm joined by JP Mason and Declan McConville for the Axon Bulletin. I hope the periods are well, gentlemen, despite the fact that news is filtering in that is putting a lot of doubt in Celtic fans' minds around the Eddie Howe deal or no deal. Uh, we're going to be looking at that throughout the show today. There's a few other uh, points to talk about Celtic-related. Um, if you are tuning in via YouTube, Facebook or Twitter, then feel f- free to comment. I'm sure the comment section is going to be extremely busy today. Uh, we'll try and get through as many of them at the moment because the big question is, uh, do Celtic need Eddie Howe more than he needs us? This is on the back, I guess, of the reports overnight, um, specifically from Sky Sports and the Daily Mail, that Eddie Howe is not looking to, to go anywhere until the summer. The talk of a deal being done um, is premature. And there's been significant interest from a number of clubs. So Celtic, obviously, are one of those clubs. JP, I will come to you straight away. Can Celtic afford to wait until the summer to appoint a new manager? I mean... Not really, no, but I think a lot of people were kind of expecting that it would be a kind of a summer appointment or at least an end of the season appointment. Um, I know everybody's preference would be that a new manager would come in or a new head coach would come in to uh, take up the reins now. But if it is to be Eddie Howe, what we've read, whether it's 100% true or not, is that he wanted to wait a full year out of foot, take a full year out of football um, before he returned to management. So, if that's the case, then it would be the summer. So, but I mean, it has to be, you know, <laughs> the minute the season ends, he comes in because, well, there's the, there's the, uh, the proof. Right there, 103 days to the Champions League qualifiers begin, and, and that's going to go down to double digits next week. Um, 103 days, you know, just over three months. And uh, I'll ask yourself uh, the same question, Declan. Uh, We're not in a situation, are we, really, uh, to wait that long? If there's been an agreement, then fine, come along. And you would expect something to be done in the in the background in terms of assessing the squad. But if there is absolutely no agreement and he is still available to the likes of uh, the English clubs who are going to be looking for managers between now and the end of the season... Any of the Premiership clubs down south could, you know, offer him more money. I mean, that that much is clear. It's obvious to everybody. But not only that, they can offer him bigger budgets in terms of building his own squad down south. And that's obviously a consideration. Declan, can we wait until the summer is a big question? Because I would say absolutely not. We really can't wait until then. I don't think we can, Paul. Um, I think season ticket renewal forms will be imminent as well and that's another selling point that the club are going to need to look at it can't be a blank form with John Kennedy's face on it um, because I don't think fans are going to accept that going forward as well I mean last night there was a story broke that the club might free Lee Griffiths we've already we know Shaw's going to come in from Sheffield Wednesday the captain's departing the club Hammond's leaving the club so there's all this going on in the background but nobody at the forefront of it which is a real concern because that number is concerning We've got players that are going to depart that's concerning. We've got players that we want to know want to leave, which is another worry. So just now, on the opening day of the Masters, this season has been a bogey. Let's not make it a double bogey. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Now, uh, JP, uh, do you think, because I think you could probably look, look at it in two ways, and I've seen both. I've been having a look at social media. I've seen both opinions on this. One opinion would say, well, Eddie Howe's been playing Celtic he, you know I don't think he needs to if I'm being honest if he wants a job in management and he wants a job down south then he will have sufficient interest in that I don't think he needs to use Celtic to get back into the, the headlines etc uh, the other way to look at it is that Celtic have had discussions which have been confirmed we've, we've discussed the job with Eddie Howe and we have not um, given him what he's requesting. Now, we had concerns, didn't we, all around the structure from director of football right down to his fellow coaches. Do you think that's been a stumbling block? It's, it's very possible that it is and it has been. Uh, I, I would find that I was thinking about this earlier on. I was thinking about the whole, if we were halfway down the road with Fergal Harkin, you know, was it just going to be the case that we expected any head coach that we approached to be like, oh, this is the guy you're working with. We've already agreed this. 
you know, regardless of what you may or may not want, this is this is this is what's happening now. That is complete speculation on my part. I don't know if that is actually what happened, but if it is what's happened, and Eddie Howe's gone, well, actually, no, I'd prefer to bring in uh, Richard Hughes, which I know is a bit of a bold thing to say. Well, I want to bring in the guy that's going to be working sort of, you know, above me, so to, so to speak, rather than alongside me in the in the dugout. Um, I, I would have thought that that would have just been a case of like, well, we're sorry, Fergal, but. Um, you know, we're actually going to have to go with this because this is what the coach demands. But it also potentially shows so much um, lack of forward planning from the club. You know, it's, you know, surely they had a, a target identified, you know, quite a while ago, and and that would be what they were uh, pursuing, rather than just being like, oh, actually, now this has happened, we need to kind of, you know, um, change things. Um, so, and the, the the chat of 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 John Kennedy and Gavin Strachan being kept on. Um, I've, I've, I've said I don't know if I said this on the on the sh- on the show before, but I've certainly said it to to people I've spoken to. If that is what he wants, then fine. But if it's not, then then we're in trouble. Well, we've done it before, and you think once bitten twice shy, but Celtic have done it more than once. We we you know we had that scenario with Ronnie Dyla coming in. We were trying to line up someone's backroom team, and that's the reason Ronnie eventually got the job himself. Uh, we've done the same with Neil Lennon second time round. We are selecting his coaching staff for him. Um, I don't see any kind of um, point where Neil Lennon's blamed that. You know that that's so speculating. It has been a big issue, the fact that he didn't select his coaching staff. But surely you need to select your own staff. Although I get the situation around, um, you know, selecting the staff who are going to be operating above you in the in the structure. Um, although you know, if that is going to be an issue for Eddie Howe, and we then downgrade, if you like, to someone who will work under these conditions, and there's plenty of managers I guess who will, then you know, I think it's going to be the final insult to potential season ticket renewals, Declan, so I'll come to yourself, just while um, JP answers his door to Roy Keane, because he's been chatting the door all week um, now, I'm going to come to yourself Declan, is that going to be the final insult if we can't get this deal over the line? I think it will be the final insult, Paul, because the whole season's been a complete catastrophe if we were sitting in a position where the whole thing was rosy in the garden, I don't think it would be as big a concern. But, you know, when you hear stories come out that you've had players in the building and deals haven't got done, we know the situation when Neil Lennon with his coaching staff that he probably didn't want Gavin Strachan. So there is a worry and a concern that if we continue to proceed like this, we're not going to get anything done. And I think there is probably a concern in the club's part that we end up with a Rogers situation where after two and a half, three years, those people leave and they get left where they were in February 2019, which is a reasonable concern. But at this point in time, we need action. We need it sorted. As much as we'd all maybe like a, a brand new spanking structure, we, we want results. We want to get that league title back. So if anyhow's demands aren't being met, then I would have real serious concerns going forward. JP, we're just talking about weighing this up. Uh, the, the situation Celtic are in at the moment, as Declan quite rightly says, is one that uh, we don't want to be left high and dry again, uh, as we were when Brennan Rodgers decided to up and leave. Um, insofar as you know, we want to have a structure where if one part of that structure moves, we just replace them with the best man for that job. Mm. Um, and we've got someone who's coming in, and Eddie Howe making demands, uh, apparently, in relation to parts of that structure that he wants to put in place and Declan quite rightly says if he was to come in and perform as we think he may be able to uh, and he's a success at Celtic in two and a half years down the line he gets that similar offer from down south this may be from a team of a higher kind of standing than what he would get at the moment due to his success with Celtic Uh, very much like Brennan Rodgers he takes a number of staff with him and we're back to scratch uh, so on the one hand, I can see the club, you know, being reluctant to do that. But then, do we really have the time under these circumstances, JP, um, to negotiate the way that we normally would in a, in a position of strength? Well, uh, Jim Orr always uses the stick or twist analogy, doesn't he? And uh, and that, and that's is kind of applicable here because you've got the, on the one hand, you've got the idea that well, if you give the manager what he wants, then he's going to be starting on the best. Uh, foot possible in terms of everything 
Um, but then if you don't, and then you're hedging your bets as to what happens further down the line, then you're going, okay, well, if he does go, then we'll be well compensated for that at the time, you know, if he does take everybody. So it's, it's a, it's a, it is a bit of a catch-22, but you'd like to think that the people in charge of have, have got the, the correct business now and people skills to be able to manage this situation rather than just letting it get into a, a sort of a game of cat and mouse, you know. Um, I, I, that's my take on it. Now, John Kennedy and Gavin Strachan have been mentioned today and I must admit, when i seen the uh, tweet from, or the article from Stephen McGowan of the Daily Mail who is more often than not spot on uh, when he speaks about Celtic and I've got a lot of respect for Stephen but he spoke about the fact that Eddie Howe apparently was uh, quite happy with John Kennedy and Gavin Strachan being part of his coaching setup. I was a bit concerned at that because I thought really? Now there was then that story last week from Gordon Strachan who was, who was almost preparing us for this today because he was mm. saying, oh, you know, don't get too... Um, didn't get too excited here about Eddie Howe. He may get a job down south. And I'm thinking, well, was he just preparing us for this moment? Uh, that concerns me a wee bit as well because we know that Gordon Strachan still works pretty closely with the club, um, not just in the media son. side of things. <laughs> and as does his son, yeah. So he's, he's got kind of like good source intelligence coming from his laddie um, at the end of a, a working day. Uh, I guess the question now would be then, Declan, is do we bow down to these demands? Now, I and many other Celtic fans are probably ordinarily of the view that no player is bigger than the club, no man is bigger than the club, right? But under the circumstances, I think we're we're all of the view, correct me if I'm wrong, that he is the best candidate that we've been linked with, realistic candidate. We can get Eddie Howe if we really want to get him and we meet the demands, we can get him. Do you think we need to bow down to these demands under the circumstances, Dick? I obviously don't know what the position of the club is just now, but if they have put all their eggs into one basket with Eddie Howe, they're going to need to bow down to the circumstances because that's the situation that we're in. Because if not, we're going to end up with a two-bit Bob management team that wasn't really lined up to take the job. So if all the eggs have been put into one basket, yes. If not, and there is still candidates that they have interviewed and they still think that they could be uh, up for the job. I know today Football Insiders ran a story with uh, Favre that used to be at um, Bruce mm-hmm. Dortmund. Mm-hmm. It's still a name kicking about. It's still a big name that would attract crowds and make people buy into. Um, but at this point in time, we're not in a position of strength to negotiate. So I think with the mess that we're in, probably we do need to meet his demands because he is the most realistic target and if we don't get him and we don't get somebody in that level, I think Celtic fans are going to be bitterly disappointed. I, I think so. I really do. And when this development happens, because we cover Celtic on a daily basis and we cover all developments, every nuance of what goes on at Celtic, as it's developing, you then start looking back to some of the other changes that have been happening and you ask yourself, is this connected to the scenario? So obviously we know that Dominic Mackay's coming in. He's going to be coming in early on the 19th of April before taking over as the CEO on the 1st of July. Uh, JP, do you think that's partly uh, the reason he's coming in early, the fact that we have come up against some serious stumbling blocks in relation to getting a new man in. I think he must have uh, assessed the absolute bin fire that our season has been <laughs> uh, and, you know, thought, right, I need to get in, I need to get in there earlier. And yeah, OK, he's not coming in as a CEO at, uh, in, a, in a week's time or, what is it? Is it a two weeks' time? Um Time, I, I don't think he's, you know, regardless of the fact he's, he gets to see the inner uh, sort of workings of the club and how things, who, who everyone is, meet everybody and probably be able to hit the ground running a bit better than when he starts as CEO. Um, but, I mean, if he had any idea of the scale of what he's going to have to deal with, then uh, he's getting a head start by coming in early and... I don't know. Maybe, maybe the sort of the idea in my head is that are we waiting for him to come in before we announce the manager? There is no. I mean, if 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 he is coming in the summer, there is no real need to announce him right now. It's not. It's just everybody's on tenterhooks because it's been so much fed in the media and whatnot. Mm. But um, if we were to wait until Dominic Mackay's in the door, and then then there was a sort of photo shoot with Dominic Mackay 
Eddie Howe, you know, all the rest of it, the director of football or technical director, you know, is that part of the plan? And then boom, season tickets, renewals, you know, it could be, I, I might be speculating. M- maybe something will happen in the next week or two and that's absolute nonsense, but that's just what I was thinking. This is a big thing, going back to the season ticket point that Declan made earlier. You know, um, many, many Celtic fans will renew their season tickets. Um, I will be buying my wee boy his first season ticket for next season, um, even though he probably won't watch much of the football and will want to go down <laughs> to speak to Hoopy uh, most of the time. The, the situation that we're in at the moment is there's a huge amount of people, particularly when it comes down to finan- the financial aspect of this, Declan, that... I don't think we're waiting for a marquee announcement. I don't think that works at Celtic, to be honest with you. And we've seen them in terms of players, haven't we? We've seen the big marquee signings coming in. I think Celtic fans now want to have that um, assurance that there is a stability and the manager is part of that. I- I've seen nothing but positives, I've got to say, in relation to the new CEO coming in. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I've not seen any any real negative uh, feedback from Celtic fans on that appointment. Well, uh, we I don't just fans slagged his haircut on Twitter, but I mean, that's, it, that's, that's, that's par for the course, isn't it? They just go for the hair. Is. They go for the hair. They go for the hair. <laughs> they do. Um, which is interesting because I've got, I've got Sky Sports playing up there. They're talking about uh, harassment on social media channels, etc. Mm. And uh, yeah, my hair gets a lot of harassment, but uh, I'm all right. I'm all right. Um, but Jake, w- when you're looking at the season tickets, I think there are many, many fans that are, are going to hold off um, until this announcement is made, but we can't make the announcement if the number one target is saying I'm, I'm, I'm making no moves. And this this apparently was a representative of how, um, you know, I'm not making any moves until, until summer. So uh, with that in mind, Declan, are, are Celtic kind of backed into a corner? And if so, do they look elsewhere? As I said earlier, if there is a short list of not put all the eggs into was one basket, yeah, I think it would be smart to look elsewhere and see if there is another possible structure that would work. Because as you say, Paul, we all want stability at the club. And, you know, if Eddie Howe does come in the door, I don't think anybody will have any complaints, even if it is on the terms that he wants. What happens two and a half, three years down the line, we'll see when we get there. But I think some Celtic fans will hold off which I think they've got every right to do as well because of the way this season's panned out. I'll be buying my season ticket. But, um, yeah, I think that the club need to watch that they've not put all their eggs into one basket. That's all I would say. And again, on the the news that came out last night, it could just be Eddie Howe's representatives trying to push Celtic into a corner a wee bit more too to say, listen, we know our, our, our man's got other places interested in him, but he wants to come here. You know, the deal's on the table, get it done, which, you know, can work sometimes in football. It certainly can, because obviously, you know, in this world, this media age, Declan, you drop that that bombshell, next thing you know, you know, 200, 2,000 news sources online are running the story. Uh, every podcast is talking about it. The club can gauge pretty quickly the fan opinion, which is something that would have been a lot more difficult 15, 20 years ago. But almost instantly, the club can gauge that, can't they, with, with the powers of social media um, and, and podcasting and all these different types of uh, communications and content creations um, methods. Now, when we're looking at some of the names that have been mentioned, I'm going to come over to the comments in a sec. In a second or so. Um, I think again we have gone in depth and we've given the old deep dive on most of the, the managers that have been mentioned. We spoke about uh, Lucia Favre that's how you pronounce it uh, Declan, former Borussia Dortmund manager uh, yeah, we ha- That was uh, National 5 French let me down there so. <laughs> No you're probably right and I was wrong, I took German um, so anyway, uh, you know we have spoken about him, we've spoken about Roy Keane and uh, the backlash that came from my suggestion that Roy Keane might be the man in charge, you know, that tweet uh, may not age that well or who knows. And uh, Enzo Maresca, I think that it was us three that spoke about the Harkin Maresca um, team. Uh, and I think by the end of the podcast, we're all kind of seeing the, the reasoning behind it. Um, 
John Kennedy, whose name is appearing quite a bit in the comment section here. But here's one for you as well, and this links into some developments yesterday. And I'm going to bring up Irene Welsh, uh, and my eyesight's so bad that I actually read that as Irvin Welsh. <laughs> um, but it's Irene, so welcome to the show, Irene. You're commenting on YouTube. Jack Ross, because he will oversee significant downsizing of the player wage bill post-COVID times. All the highest earners will be shipped out for more economical signings. Now, let's have a look at the situation. Now, Celtic, in the great scheme of things, um, I was yesterday looking at the Hibs finances, just as it happens, you mentioned Jack Ross. Um, Scottish football clubs, you know, have been hit, like every other club, all over um, the world, all over the sport, financially, of course they have. But Celtic, when you look at it, are in a, a, a fairly fairly good position under the circumstances and, and we've discussed that in a previous podcast as well. The reason that they're selling this summer if indeed they do sell any of their, their prized assets, I don't think it's because they need to financially fill that gap. I think it's because, for example, let's use Odson Edward as an example. He's coming to the end of his time at Celtic and it really wouldn't benefit him or us if he was to stay any longer. Um, and also if he does stay any longer the value is going to drop season on season so I would expect someone him, like him to go in any case who knows how much we're going to get for him but it won't be anywhere near the figures we were discussing 12 months ago uh, you're then looking at guys that are kind of surplus to requirements and I was thinking about this one yesterday as well we've got a lot of players who could probably command fees of between 2 to 2.5 million now some of them uh, you think to yourself, is us losing money? Guys like Barkas, if, if we decide to, to move Barkas on, you're probably going to have to, um, you know, take half what you paid for him to, to shift him back to maybe a team in Greece. But, you know, Lee Griffiths, interesting, we'll come back to the, the story that dropped last night, Declan, that you've already mentioned. Under normal circumstances, I think he's a player that you'd be looking for a couple of million quid for. Um, Olivier and Cham, his value has dropped massively since the, the time when Porto were supposedly interested for eight million quid. How much are you going to get for him? Two, two and a half, etc. It could be around about that figure. Tom Rogic. These are the types of players I think that Celtic, you know, if they do have a, an overhaul and they look at their squad and they trim it, then we could be making a lot of money from fringe players. Um, and obviously, we've already, already got Jeremy Frimpong, um, whose money is still sitting there. Um, and of course, we've got maybe one of the bigger assets like Eduard, Ayer, Christie, or both or all three. Who knows how many of those players will go. And again, I'll, I'll come back to the Kieran Tierney situation as well with regards to him possibly moving on and Celtic being in for a 15% windfall, the Dembele deal being similar. Um, he might move in the summer. So I don't think there will be this massive downsizing. I think throughout the club there will all, always be that um, on the back of COVID. But I really don't think we will be looking at someone like Jack Ross but I'm glad you brought it up, Irene Welsh. And if anybody wants to disagree with me, feel free. Because I was looking at the, the Hibs financials yesterday. And what Ron Gordon said yesterday is that Hibs themselves would be prepared and are probably expecting to sell one or two of their prized assets in the summer. And the prized assets, I guess, would be someone like Kevin Nisbet. Ryan Porteous or Josh Doig, the left back, 18 year old left back, who in actual fact I think has been linked with Leicester in the last few days. Uh, Brendan Rogers is, is quite keen on Josh Doig. So, what I would say is I don't think we're going to be downsizing as such um, due to the COVID pandemic. I think it's because all these players I've mentioned have to leave Celtic. You know, there's none of those players uh, under the circumstances that I think would, I'd be willing to keep other than Chris Iyer. Uh, and I've spoken about that. JP, when you look at the situation um, around Eddie, Eddie Howe, how much of that do you think is down to constraints with the budget? Is there a downsizing, as Irene Welsh has suggested? Do you think that is one of the spanner in the works? I, I don't think it's necessarily a, a downsizing financially, more a downsizing just because a lot of these players probably could have and should have left last summer, you know? Like, if it had been in a different environment, they probably would have. I mean, just imagine now how things would be if, if we didn't have this pandemic, you know? How many of those players would have left last summer and would it have been such a big task uh, this summer? I think just a lot of the players, their, their, their time at Celtic is probably 
expired and, and past the expiry. You know, I'm not saying the players are past their expiry date. I think it's probably just need a new challenge. But I mean, if Encham hasn't done as well as at Marseille as, as we're being led to believe, then, you know, good luck to him getting the sort of club that he probably thinks he should be playing at because, you know, I thought that was going to work out for him and it doesn't sound like it is. Um, so the grass isn't always greener um, on the other side and maybe these players might want to reassess what they're what they're going to be doing. But I think Russell made a good point and me and him were messaging about it, uh, the whole selling the vision. You know, I think we need to reassess what we do uh, when we're actually going for players um, and whether that's downsizing or not, I and mean, it's considered downsizing, going for a player that, you know, isn't he just thinking two seasons max, you know, you want you want players that are actually like this is this is the biggest club I'll ever play for. And this is mm. the best time I'll ever have in my career. As many players have cited Celtic as being that uh, when they reflect back on their on their on their playing careers. Samaras just off the top of my head being one. Mm-hmm. So yeah. What about yourself, Declan? We're talking about uh, the types of signings as well. I've mentioned the three Hibs boys personally. I don't think Kevin Nisbet can make the step up to Celtic and it's no disrespect to him. I think he's done brilliantly well with Hibs coming in from Dunfermline. He's got his Scottish cap. I don't think he would be, for me, a success at Celtic. We've seen so many players who can't take that step up who were fantastic players at their clubs, like Scott Allen, for example. I remember watching him at Hibs. I thought he was tremendous, tremendous talent. And when we signed him, I was delighted. And it wasn't because we were signing him and Rangers weren't signing him. I thought he was a good addition to the squad at that time. You look at a player like Nadia Chiefchi scoring 20 goals for Dundee United. I mean, who scores 20 goals in the Premier League for Dundee United? And, and he comes in a total flop at Celtic. There's a certain type that I think just won't make it at Celtic. I think it's too much of a step up for Kevin Nisbet. I've not been that... So, you know that impressed with Porteous either I'm going to be honest with you I, I really haven't been that impressed I think of the three if Celtic were to try and pursue any of them I think Josh Doig and, and you look at um, our squad as well that's where we need to strengthen I mean I think we need to strengthen in various areas but when you look at that left back position I think he would be a good um, a good target for Celtic I guess what you would be saying then is Greg Taylor's your your first choice left back Declan and you're you're hoping that Doig pushes him and pushes him for a place and you allow Luxalt to go back to, to Milan on the and the huge wages that he's earning. I mean, is that something that Celtic should do more often uh, when you look at the success of David Turnbull coming in from another Scottish club? I think sometimes it will work like David Turnbull. At times, though, if we are buying young Scottish players, there will still be the question as to why Celtic aren't producing young Scottish players is another worry because we've saw how well Stephen Belch has come in and adapted to his surroundings. We've still got other guys uh, that are out on various loan deals that could come in. Uh, Luca Cono in midfield being one, um, who I met in the park on Sunday and was very chatty and said that uh, she's enjoying his time at Queen's Park and you know he would like to come back and have another go at Celtic. So you might see that. Um, but guys like Doig, I think Nesbitt could possibly be one for Celtic. I think he's very raw still. Um Again, went to spoke to Jackie McNamara, who said that he didn't get how Chiffy went from scoring all those goals at Dundee United to then Celtic. He actually blamed that Ronnie Dyla for um, Chiffy's lack of goals at Celtic. He said they never got enough games. Said he was badly coached, etc. So I think it just depends as well on the circumstances that a player comes in. The free at Hibs, you know, we are going to need to look more in the league, more domestically, and in the wider scope because again, COVID Brexit, but. You know, I don't think signings like that would really please Celtic fans because at this point, I think we're going to be able to buy players that are first team ready. Mm. And a lot of these guys would really be projects that have not really got time to, to bed in. Now, it's an interesting point you made there about Chief J, uh, JP, and I'd need to check this, and someone could check on the Celtic wiki while I'm speaking. Didn't he play in the game against Red Imps for Brendan Rodgers? Didn't he make, uh, he might come on as a sub? I'm and sure he played. Also, yeah, uh, I'm sure he played. On. He did, didn't he? Yeah, I think so. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, but he played that game as well. Yes, he certainly did. He did play um, in that particular game. But I just think it's a situation where would that be seen as downsizing? In the case of Doig, I don't think so. I just think he's such a promising young player that at that age, you know, he's got interest coming in from from Leicester City. Um, I think he would definitely be worth, uh, worth pursuing. But you were talking there about... Um, 
bumping into Luca Connor was very impressed that it was a socially distant selfie that you took with him, <laughs> Declan, and you were sporting the Axon t-shirt, so you got two big uh, ticks in the box for that. But another guy I was reading about recently is uh, Leo Held, who's 17 years of age. Um, he's, he's been away at Ross County getting first team experience and already JP Southampton Southampton are showing an interest in this young player um, it seems to be that we are not developing enough players for Celtic we are developing players I mean one of the most recent um, departures was Cameron Harper and he's obviously away back to, to he's away to New York the New York Red Bulls and he gave an interview in relation to his development that's one thing he didn't criticise was his development as a player but unfortunately once again Celtic haven't seen the fruits of their labour JP I want a manager to come in um, and that's encapsulated in their job description you need to you know work with your director of football technical director um, head of football whatever the term's going to be to ensure that we have got um, a conveyor belt of talent coming through every year now I don't expect six players to come through and play for the first team every single season but I expect more than the amount we're getting at the moment JP Yeah I, I, I read that as well about um, Held uh, and uh, from what I've can, from what i heard he's quite highly rated and he's a defender so I don't think we're in a position where we can be letting highly rated young defenders leave the club because you know they're, 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 on a, they're at a premium um, and, and it is starting to get a bit concerning that a lot of these players are looking elsewhere or potentially looking elsewhere. You know, the ones we've mentioned before, like um, Liam Morrison and, uh, and and various others. Um, so, yeah, I mean, whoever comes in, that's, that's, that's got to be the number one priority is just um, creating plans and making uh, a pathway to the, to the first team for these players again because... I think I said before that the, the, the whole nine, eight, nine, ten in a row thing has probably shut the door on a lot of these guys um, mm. just because, well, you know, why would we be, uh, it sounds bad to say this, but why would we be entrusting first team places with like youth players when the, the goal was so massive, whereas that's gone now. So, you know, the, the path, that pathway should be, should be clear again. Um, and somebody should be putting an arm around these guys and saying, yeah, this you'll get your opportunity. Just, uh, just stick in, you know, and 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 we'll, we'll make it happen. But yeah, that 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 was concerning um, mainly because he's a he's a he's a he's a young defender, and you know, it's just it's it's not a, it's not a good position. <laughs> we we need almost an entire new defence. So mm. uh, letting somebody like that go, especially to Southampton, you know, it's just like you know, surely you could convince them to stay and do a few seasons here and play for the first team here. Um, before he goes and makes a step down there. No, you're right. And um, I'm leading towards my, my final point on this one. Uh, Thomas Hanlon comes in via YouTube to say, Kevin Graham was right the other day, this sums up the Lowell era. Um, well, Lowell, Peter Lowell may have left us with a couple of parting gifts in sell-on clauses for the likes of Kieran Tierney, and Moussa Dembele because obviously Dembele went out on loan he could go back to his parent club he may be sold Kieran Tierney interestingly enough has been described as uh, Pat Nevin as potentially world football's most expensive defender now I don't know how much you would uh, agree with that uh, in relation to Pat Nevin <laughs> but if for example he was to become the world's most expensive defender who is the world's most expensive defender at the moment is it still Harry Maguire? Oh yeah, it will be. Yeah. Eighty mil, eighty mm -hmm. million, and then you start thinking, well, if he was to leave Arsenal and go to another English club, because apparently Man City might be interested, what kind of fee are you talking about? That seriously, lads, what kind of fee do you think Arsenal would be demanding? I was thinking more fifty million. Is it more than that? I would say about seventy, eighty million, probably for Kim Tierney. It's incredible. That is incredible in, in today's market. Because if you do think about it, and it's a thing I thought about a lot, Paul, and even European football. I, would struggle to give you three left backs in world football that are better than him. Alfonso Davies is one I watched last night for Bayern Munich, but you know, Marcello's in his mid 30s, I think now. Luke Shaw's had a decent season, but mm. Chilwell, I don't think, is in Kieran Tierney's league. I think Kieran Tierney's better than Andrew Robertson, so I would really struggle apart from Alfonso Davies. That's incredible. So 75, 80 million reckons, Deck. What about yourself? Is it just because, obviously? Uh, the, you know the finances down there are just off the scale JP but are we looking at a fee like that for and the reason I'm talking about Tierney 
yeah, he's a, he's an excel, and you know we're still fond of Kieran Tierney. I think that will always be there. He's obviously had a, a, a unfortunate injury uh, against Liverpool just uh, the other day. There, they reckon he'll be out for four to six weeks, so it's not something that's requiring surgery. But I'm keeping an eye on it because you know that kind of transfer fee would be massive for Celtic. I mean, I think it's 15% we've got as a sell-on on Kieran Tierney. Could he really command 75, 80 million, JP? I mean, the thing is, he's doing it week in and week out and he's proven himself to be, you know, the stick out in that Arsenal team, you know. Um, if if there was fans in the stadium, they would have a song for him, I'm sure, uh, and he would be lauded by the entire ground as he was at Celtic, you know. And if you if you can win over a support like that then that I, I think that is the true value of your of your your transfer fee because you know uh, you know football supporters yes there are some stupid ones but in the main if you can tap into that vein of like being universally lauded and liked by the entire support as he clearly is then that shows the value of him so whoever comes in has got a stump up to to buy that before, you know before you even talking about you I'm kicking a ball um, and it just so happens that he's very good at football as well. And, you know, to all the people who would slag us, you know, when we used to say about how great Kieran Tierney was, I watched him week in, week out as a season ticket holder and a fair few away games as well. And you could see his quality, like, absolutely shining through in every game. And you would always come away raving about how good was Tierney today? How good was Tierney today? I don't know how many times I said that. Same with Scott Brown as well. I mean, the amount of times I said that about both of those players... Um, and and Tierney's now doing it for Arsenal, and it's it's great to see. I mean, it, it really is great to see because um, he's got his head screwed on. Seems like a normal guy, likes his music, and uh, I just hope he stays away from the blue half of Manchester. <laughs> I, I, I can't I can't even bear the idea of seeing him seeing him in a Man City stuff. It just it would, it would kill me. But um, yeah, it, it all comes back to the fact that we sh- we should be uh, developing and giving far more progression to the youth players, Declan. When you look at the kind of success that someone like Kieran, we're talking about him being the, potentially the most expensive defender in world football. And he came from our academy. And it's something to be proud of, but it's also something to, to, to kind of work on. You've got to say, well, why aren't we doing that? Now, I'm not going to say you're going to produce a tierney every single season. Yeah. And as a club, if we sell them for 25, and a lot of Celtic fans reckon it was too, uh, too little a fee, then they know that that's paying for the academy for, who, who knows, 10 years, 8 years, something like that. But, uh, you know, as a Celtic fan, I, I don't look at it like that. I don't think, oh, that's OK, we don't have to produce somebody for another 10 years. I want to produce players far more regularly than we are currently and I hope that the new structure that comes in is part and parcel of that you know looking at the youth development but I guess I'm going to come round to my my point eventually my point is um, having looked at uh, the fact that Kevin Graham's name's popped up on the comment section Kevin Graham has spoken about Jack Ross right so keep the boos and the hisses to a minimum here right is he a candidate if Eddie Howe isn't appointed as a Celtic manager and if he is you know how's that going to be received by the Celtic supporters Declan I'm going to ask you first once you can allow that to to seep in to the possibilities that might occur over the next weeks and months I think if you were to ask me six months ago was Jack Ross a candidate for the Celtic job in the summer I would have probably said yes because I think if we had done the business this season we would have probably embarked on a kind of fiscal downsize turn Get a lot of guys out the door, looked for a younger manager, he would have fitted the bill. Him or John Kennedy, I think John was probably always lined up to even get the job himself, but um, no, I don't think so. I don't think that will please Celtic fans. I, I think we need to aim big here. I mean, we need to get an aim in or a, a, a structured, but I don't think Jack Ross would, would please Celtic fans, no. No, I don't think he would. I don't think John Kennedy would. And from the yeah. list that we've been talking about, I actually don't think Roy Keane would. And I've had very yeah. few very few people disagree with that. Uh, JP, here's a man whose progression um, up to Hibs, uh, people go on about his time at Sunderland, etc. I think they were a bit premature in sacking him, of him, being honest. But um, he's led Hibs to the third place finish. First time since 2005 that Hibs have finished in third place in the Scottish League. Um, he's getting them into Europe, of course. Um, you know, Know, barring an absolute catastrophe, they're going to finish third, they're going into Europe, they've held on to their 
star players, one or two, whom may be going in the summer. Um, surely Celtic aren't going to be looking. And it's no disrespect to Jack Ross, but Celtic needs something different at this moment in time. No, I, I, I don't have a, an issue with Jack Ross. I think he's a, I think he's a, seems like a good guy, and he definitely he's been a good uh, uh, coach at the clubs that he's worked at. And yeah, I watched that Sunderland uh, documentary, which I thought was was excellent. I, I can't believe that it was allowed to <laughs> be filmed, really, to be honest, because it was just so kind of candid. It was it was almost a bit voyeuristic watching it, you know. And as are all of these ones, I've not watched the. The Man City one or the Spurs one, yeah, I might, I might get around to that. But um, yeah, I thought, I, I think Jack Ross is is, do, is doing a good job with Hibs, and he seems to be going down well with their support. But you know, I, I just don't. I, we we get it so tight for taking players off Hibs. If we go in and take the manager, it's just going to be, <laughs> you know, you'll never hear the end of it from Hibs fans. And you know, especially if it doesn't work out, because they'll be like, oh look, you just wrecked her. Our, uh, momentum and you've brought him in and he's he's made a mess of you and, and you know the job is too big for him or whatever so I think we should leave leave Jack Ross and leave Hibs well alone and pursue uh, pursue other other targets and I, I sincerely hope that the number one target is still Eddie Howe Well let's have a look to see what others are saying uh, OB Boy how isn't coming is no going way. to be Kennedy no, no, reckons no, OB no, Boy and mm. Kaplow Mark on YouTube, have we again tried to cobble together a management team with no previous connections? I think that's maybe part of the issue, to be fair, you know, reading everything that's been released and trying to read between the lines. I think that has been part of the, the situation here. Um, in comes Hunter Nick Bund Pena. I think John Kennedy is your manager. Um, no, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, absolutely. And David Bradley comes in to say season books are watching. Now, I've always been one, Declan, to say that don't go for profile. You know, don't go for profile because it's, it should be about your, your fibre, your substance as a manager. So for me, Roy Keane is profile. And that's the reason why somehow Celtic think it would be a good idea to bring in Roy Keane. This marquee appointment, but for, it, it just won't work. That simply will not work for me. It's not about the profile. If you were to to pitch as a football club someone like Favre, um, who you mentioned before, Declan, I could buy that. I could yeah. buy what he's done previously. If you were to try and tell me about someone like Enzo Maresca, ma- you know, marrying up with a Fergal Harkin kind of team, we spoke about it about a month ago, JP. Mm. It wouldn't be your first choice, but you could see the, the thinking. And I think that going back to something that Declan said, had we won 10 in a row, that would have probably been, you know, agreed. Yeah, we're going to have to take a different direction. Let's build for more of a long term kind of vision. Um, but then once you start getting to the territory of John Kennedy, Jack Ross, your season tickets uh, are going to be a much harder sale than they are already because you've got to remember that people are are looking at the pennies. When will we be back into the stadium? So again, you're buying a season ticket knowing that it's going to be several months before you get back in um, to watch to watch your team. So I think, you know, I don't think Celtic have put all their eggs in one basket, Declan. I think they have gone through the, the process better than they did the last time when we appointed Neil Lennon uh, in the showers, apparently. But I think that we all believed it was going to happen. I mean, I've, I've got to say myself, I, I thought not so much a done deal. We've been stung in the past with done deals and, and, you know, we won't be stung again. But I did think myself, yeah, absolutely, this is going to happen. So I'm going to ask you the question, Dick, straight out. Does Celtic need Eddie Howe more than he needs us right at this moment in time? At this moment in time, yeah, I believe so. We are in a, a mess. We need to sort ourselves out and I think he's the man to do that and the longer this drags on the more worry we have um, again though I will go back to what I said if the short list and there is candidates on the list that could fulfil the club's needs maybe we don't need them as much but again I don't know what point Celtic are at with that I don't know who they've spoken to exactly so at this point in time as the name because of what's been out in the press yeah, I think we do need anyhow more than uh, he needs us what about yourself, JP? Are we in a situation at this moment in time where we're just going to have to admit that we really need this guy? He fits the bill. He ticks all the boxes, including the season ticket, um, sales, etc. Let's just go out and go all out and get him. 
Oh, it seems that way. And I, 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 again, I can't remember if I said this before, but you know, the whole Enzo Maresca thing, I do wonder if that that was firmly in the club's thoughts. And then when when it was put out there, they gauged the reaction from the from the from the Celtic support and you know Joe Blog Celtic fan was just like who's this guy I mean, I've got no I've got no idea he is you know I'm not happy with this and there's a lot of fans that you know I mean fair enough there's a lot of fans that are open minded and would have been like yeah that that sounds like it could be good he's got a good track record we could we could be potentially getting the next up and coming you know um sort of gold star coach so to speak but then there's so many fans that would just be like, never heard of them, you know, mm-hmm. next. So, mm-hmm. you know, that, that, that maybe went into the thinking and that's when they kind of thought, God, we really need to, we need to push the boat out here and we need to, you know, ask the question of someone like Eddie Howe. We need to listen to Tony Haggerty and say, well, ask the question. So they've gone and asked the question and now they're sitting at the negotiation table with Eddie Howe and that's when there's always, you know, uh, uh, things flying around that are affecting the, the outcome. If if that is indeed what is happening, we don't know. It, it could all be done and dusted and it's just a case of it's on ice, um, mm. you know, and they're waiting their moment. So, Michael the boy comes in via Twitter. Uh, on the question, no player or man is bigger than Celtic Football Club. Now, yeah, absolutely. And I, I kind of go by that myself. But I just think that we are in a situation at the moment where there needs to be a compromise uh, under the circumstances. Um, now, on the subject of uh, Kieran Tierney, Zinko Vicks comes in to say, Kieran Tierney could play for Madrid, Barcelona, Juventus, Bayern Munich. Dortmund is that good I remember the conversation we had it was Kevin Graham and I um, back in the day when, when we sold Tierney and I asked is this Tierney's level is, can he go any higher and I think at that point Kevin said no this is his level but I was convinced back then I've got to say I'm not always right and very rarely right I thought no Kieran Tierney could get, could get even better than us he could go even higher than us and I think he could um, but in terms of the transfer fee I just want him to go where even if it's Man City JP I just want him to go where uh, the transfer fee is at its absolute premium because I want the 15% uh, sell on that Celtic have got because I reckon that, that that could come quite useful for uh, the season two, ahead I'd be happy with two of those clubs and you can figure out which ones but... <laughs> and why <laughs> uh, absolutely Jim Hannaway comes in I mean the reluctance to accept that Kieran Tierney was world class up here by oh, non Celts um, mm. and there certainly was and I think this feeds into Brew Money's uh, comment as well on YouTube a lot of our youth players are going to Bayern Munich etc we have a world class youth system and we need to play them more often. So do you think that's true, Declan? We need to trust them a wee bit more. We need to, and, and potentially, over the last three, four, five seasons, we've not done it because there's been such a focus on the here and now to get us to the 10. I think what JP said there, there has been a naivety and a reluctance to give youth players a chance, and it is gone. So you do need to look at that. There has been players that have came through, Paul, that you know look OK and should probably do a job. If you think back to January, with a St Myrne side that came to Celtic Park that had Marcus Fraser in it, who again was part of our youth system, and yet you're finding guys like that coming back to, to haunt you. So I think the youth system probably could be something that could be improved further. Um, but I think certainly going forward, it's something that we need to really take a hold on because every world class or every you know elite football club, if you will, has a very good youth system that produces good quality players. Now, Celtic aren't ever going to get to that Ajax or Manchester City level likely but they can certainly try and uh, get up to that standard or try and hit the heights and set those kind of standards. There's a few comments coming in saying uh, Kian Tino is one in a generation. Absolutely. And I get also that whole argument around Robertson being allowed to leave Celtic and you know just because he's gone on to be a success, it may not have happened had he been at Celtic. And absolutely, I, I get that. But there does seem to be a lot, a whole host of players you know, over the last few years having left Celtic and they've carved out a very successful career elsewhere, Declan, like you say. The other one that springs to my mind is Aaron Hickey. I mean, Celtic obviously had some belief in him because they've inserted a, a sell-on clause in his contract. I think Celtic made 300 grand when he went to Italy. Um, Hickey. And uh, David Kelly, going back to Ronnie Dyla. Thank you to Ronnie Dyla for KT and McGregor and others. I mean, I made the point the other night when Norway were playing that four of the players in the Norway team were all prodigies of Ronnie Dyla. You know, Martin Odegaard and uh, Chris Iyer being the most famous. 
But he had that knack of developing youth players. And Chris Iyer is someone that continually comes up on this podcast. I'm a big fan. Everybody that watches the pod knows that. I think that, um, you know, if we're going to push the boat out for Eddie Howe, I think in terms of the playing staff, we need to push the boat out and keep Ayer as well. Uh, Because, you know, there was a big discussion uh, around the captaincy yesterday. I think that Ayer's more of a captain than even Kyler McGregor and James Forrest. That's my opinion in terms of what you need to be that leader. Uh, I think that it would be a situation with Kyler McGregor that Paul McStay found himself in JP when he was given the captaincy. I remember reading a a book, one of Billy McNeil's books, there was a couple of autobiographies over the years where he spoke about the fact that um, it may have, uh, you know, it may have been, it may have weighed too heavily on Paul McStay's shoulders to be the captain of the Celtic Football Club. And at that stage of his career, he might have been better just concentrating on playing rather than being the captain. And the one player that Billy McNeil reckons could have taken the, the pressure off for a couple of seasons was Paul Elliott. I just thought Paul Elliott was an absolute standout as a captain of Celtic. But Chris Ayer, for me, is someone that we certainly do need to to hold on on to, despite the fact that the Norwegian uh, coach reckons he needs to leave Celtic in Scottish football. And that was something that was uh, rebuffed by John Kennedy the other day, who said it was disrespectful. Yeah, I think I think it was disrespectful. Yeah. yeah. So what's your take on that? If, if you were to really push the boat out and get Eddie Howe, I think you've got to do the same with Chris Ayer. That's my opinion. And I get loads of WhatsApp messages from fellow Celtic fans who don't think Ayer's the player I believe him to be. JP, I think you'd need to offer him a new contract, wouldn't you, to keep him at the club? Ah, absolutely. Um I think if if he was if we were if whoever we get in as the coach was to manage to persuade Christopher Ayer to stay, I think yeah I, I think he is captain material just because you, you see it, 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 it you know he celebrates winning tackles in the box you know and he's got that he's got that fight about him and he, he cares I think he genuinely cares I hear a lot from people I know that say the players don't care. Um, and they haven't cared and 10 in a row was nothing to them it was just another season um, that might sound like absolute sacrilege to say that but apparently that is the case and a lot of the players didn't really care about 10 in a row um, but I think Christopher Iyer cares about winning football matches whether what, what happens at the end of that season or, or cup run or whatever is as maybe but I mean he, he stood up to take that penalty in the cup final say what you want about Hearts or anything like you know whether they're a championship club or not, or whether they're an absolute having an absolute nightmare just now, which I'm enjoying. Um, but uh, you know he he stood up to take that penalty. Massive pressure. Fair enough, no fans in the ground, but massive pressure, knowing that there was millions of people watching, and he he blasted it away and won us the cup, the quadruple treble. He's down in history for the rest of time. Uh, so I've got a lot of respect for Christopher Iyer. Yes, there's question marks over his uh, aerial prowess mm. and also in the, at the other end of the box. But I think if he was part of a good defence unit rather than just being the guy that we rely on all the time, then you'd see a better a better, uh, a better performance from him. Oh, not a better performance, but a better uh, end product, really, in terms of how you would review his, his game. Um, and maybe Tony Haggerty would give him a, an easier time. <laughs> And once again, uh, Ronnie Dyla, uh, Prodigy Maravchik, 25, comes in to remind us. Remember, we got 25.5 million for an injured Kieran Tierney. Um, and then the comments are coming in and around Jack Ross. Uh, Grace reckons that Jack Ross is not good enough. Uh, Monty comes in to say Jack Ross, no chance. But then Paul Cockwell comes in to say Jack Ross is a top manager. He's a Hibs fan. <laughs> he's going to say he that. Is. He is. Well, he's been, uh, let's be honest, he's been a top manager for Hibs. I mean, the job he's done at Hibs, I think he has. And by the way, I know a lot of Hibs fans are quite disappointed because there's been periods of that season where Hibs should have done better. Mm. Um, And you look at the way that Celtic have performed and I did predict at the beginning of the season Hibs would be second. And by the way, I mean, obviously Celtic have kind of stabled the the ship a wee bit. Um, But if we'd continued on that, you know, what was it, two wins in 12? If we'd continued down that road, Hibs would have been pushing for second. Mm. Um, And that's how close... You know, that was, and when you're looking at Jack Ross, I think he has been a top, top manager for Hibs, and I reckon he's, he's a future Scotland manager. That's what I reckon in terms of Jack Ross. But Jungle Line reminds us that everybody is a candidate 
till a new man is announced. So absolutely no disrespect to Jack Ross. None whatsoever. Um, and we're only talking about him because of the news that broke last night. I got a text, I says to you guys before we came on, got a text last night that I only woke up to this morning. And uh, when I was looking at it, I was thinking, oh, here we go. Today's Axon Bulletin is going to be quite a tasty one then because Eddie Howe isn't the done deal that we had wanted it to be. And this is a big, a big concern for me. Now, we're talking um, about players within Scottish football, Declan. You mentioned um, before about Lee Griffiths, and he, he's a product, obviously, of Scottish football. He's tried his hand down at Wolves, and uh, I'll keep reminding anybody who listened that his goal-scoring ratio continued at Wolves. It didn't go down. He didn't do any worse at Wolves. He just didn't play that many games. He then came back up to Hibs on loan, and obviously Celtic finally purchased them. Uh, 30 years of age, um, a story has dropped on, in the press last night, as it often does, Declan, um, to suggest that although he is contracted, it's very much like the Jojo Simunovic deal, where he's contracted up to 2022, but that last year of his deal is an option by the club. Are we honestly going to be losing someone like Lee Griffiths and the goals he's got um, free? Is he going to go on a free transfer? It could happen and I think it is a worry as well Paul that whoever makes that decision because at this point in time as I, I mentioned earlier on in the show that you know Hammond's away John Kennedy probably the man that's making the decision is John still going to be around the club next season I would rather whoever is coming in or whoever's going to be director of football makes these decisions so at this point in time I would hope not if that is this, the case that whoever comes in says that they want rid of him then okay that's fine by me because I think his attitude this season has been a bit of liability. Again, at last week I spoke about the, the pre-season training camp in France, which he was left out of. Um, I know later on that season, the club itself was criticised for the professionalism. So if the professionalism standards were that low, what, what kind of state of affairs were we in last July um, when we were sent to tell their player they couldn't come to pre-season training? So I think it all depends. You know, I still think he's a very good natural finisher, but if he goes, he'll, he'll score goals. And if you get the the right uh, mentality and attitude out of Lee Griffiths he'll still do a job for somebody but at this point in time I, I could see that happening yeah because especially with Scott Brown getting to Aberdeen as well that it could be something that you know the two of them want to link up there I'm going to bring up a couple of comments which shows you the two sides of the Lee Griffiths debate I'll do that in a moment but my biggest concern is right it's all great and well talked about the brilliant transfer business that we've done in the past £25 million for KT maybe not enough um, deals for Van Dyke deals for as far back as McGeady right doing a good deal for McGeady and, and bringing in a lot of money Stan Petrov I think went for about eight and a half million quid we bought him for two and a half so we've done it over the years but I think that's completely offset when A you buy a whole host of players and we've had this discussion between the two and the two and a half million pound bracket guys like Klamala etc who, who's even more than that three and a half million we have spent so much bad money on transfers but not only that there's been so many players JP and I'm going to bring Lee Griffiths into this discussion who we let go for a fraction of their their, their true value I mean Mm -hmm. at this moment in time I I mentioned at the top of the show Barkas and Cham Rogic Griffiths a fifth player that I've probably forgotten about is near Beaton now these are guys that you know go back 12 months What, what was their accumulative transfer value and then you compare it to now, right, OK, so there's a, a possibility that Lee Griffiths will be going out on a free transfer. So we've actually lost money on Lee Griffiths. I think that's astonishing um, if that, that were to be the case, JP. So although we, we're going to give people credit for all the great negotiation skills that uh, Peter Lowell may have had, you know, to get money for Dembele, etc., then there's got to be a caveat, and that is you've wasted just as much money. And I think if we allow someone like Griffiths to go, for me, if, if Edward goes, and who knows how much that, that will bring into the club, Lee Griffiths are, is our only natural goal scorer at Celtic Football Club. Mm. If you let him go, what have we got? Bio, Klamala and Ayeti. Now, who would you pair up front with, between the three, JP? I mean, I think it's grim. And I think that on the one hand, you've got Jungle Lion, coming in to say Griffiths would still be a good man to have on the bench I agree with you I don't think he would be my first pick but I, I just don't think we can afford to, to lose Edward and Griffiths uh, but then Red Scotland comes in 
and he says that he'd pay Griffiths' taxi. Get rid, no place for unprofessionalism. Where do you stand on this one, JP? Uh, I, mean, I would, I would like to have an honest, uh, an honest sort of uh, article from Lee Griffiths about what's going on. I, I would really like to know the ins and outs of what's going on because th- there's dubiety for me over his so-called lack of professionalism. You know, because he's had little sort of comments in the media where he's kind of almost intimated that yes. Yeah, he could have done better, but there was other things going on or whatever. Yeah, just it's all conjecture, really. So I, I wouldn't, I don't want to get the you know the sort of bayonet out for for Lee Griffiths and basically say, oh well, you know, uh, you know he's 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 done this and he's done that, and it's meant he's not played, and that's why you know um, he's in this position. If 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 it is his fault that he's in this position, then I'm afraid it, he definitely needs to go. But if there's fault on the club side or I, I, if, if there can be fault found in the club side for him being in this position, then I would have sympathy for him. But um, it, it does seem a bit strange that we're in a position where a guy that uh, has contributed to Celtic's uh, cause could be potentially free transferred. I mean, that that, that you just said it is kind of absurd, really, mm. that, that that's the case. Because um, if you just look at it, basically, based on his football and uh, achievements, never mind anything else. And at international level as well, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I was at that game at Hamden. My God, unbelievable when he scored those two free kicks. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it just seems a bit, a bit, a bit odd. Doesn't sit right with me that that's that that's what would happen. I don't like seeing players who have contributed, uh, regardless of what's happened in the last year or two. I know that it's been a long time since he's forty goal a season uh, uh, delivery, but I don't know. It just doesn't sit right with me. Well. Again, I think when we're, we're giving praise to the people that have made Celtic a lot of money with the transfer deals, i.e. Peter Lowell, you've also got to look at the ones that we got wrong. I mean, Simunovic, right? So we paid a lot of money for him. There was an op- there was an offer on the table by uh, Torino, and I know mm-hmm. that there was issues around his fitness. He ends up going free charge. And Boyata, Boyata, nine million nine yeah. million pound offer on the table from Fulham. He goes for now. Craig Gordon, Chelsea wanted him. And the transfer fee, I wouldn't like to say how much it was, but it was several million pounds for Craig Gordon. Mm. That's why he got the, the new deal. He goes for nothing. Lee Griffiths looks to be going for absolutely now as well. And I just think that, you know, you can undo all that good work, can't you? Um, over a procession of transfers that maybe go under the radar a wee bit. And I think Lee Griffiths could well be one of them. But one final point. JP made earlier on about certain players not really caring about the 10 in a row. I'm I'm thinking here about some of the comments that Neil Lennon made throughout the season, whereby he said that maybe the players are sick of winning. Remember that bizarre comment that he made? Maybe maybe they're sick of winning. I said that in December on this exact show. I said that I thought the players had, had, you know, bled themselves dry, you know, winning everything for four years running. That's when you look for a new challenge, you know. I said at the time as well, you know, if I was just, you know, constantly doing the same thing over and over again and I didn't feel like I was developing in any way, then, you know, I would probably look for a new challenge as well, regardless. Maybe not if it was at Celtic, but um, that's me. I'm an individual. That's not, I'm not Ryan Christie or whoever, do you know what I mean? So, yeah, it's, Lennon said it and who knows if it's actually true. Well, he did say it. Um, and then going back to that interview that Cameron Harper gave uh, on his departure from Celtic where he spoke about his development at Celtic in a positive light he did mention that there were kinds of cliques at Celtic and there wasn't a full togetherness now that that actually feeds into what you're saying JP and then you start thinking remember that picture of Encham and Stephen Welsh when Welsh has come off as a sub against Rangers in the first defeat, the 2 nothing game at Celtic Park. Mm-hmm. And then Cham looks as though he couldn't care less. Mm-hmm. And young Welsh has got his head in his hands. He's devastated that Celtic are getting beat. And then Cham doesn't seem that fussed. Now, the reason I'm bringing all this up, in order to change that culture, there's that C word again, we need a really, really strong manager. Mm-hmm. Now, let's go back to what I said about Jack Ross. I'm going to say here, it's no disrespect to Jack Ross. I think this job at this moment in time is too big for him. I don't think it's too big for Eddie Howe because it's not about selecting the players and 
building a philosophy. It's also about building a culture. And I think that culture at the moment, going by everything we've just spoken about in the last couple of minutes, JP, is wrong. And I think the right man to come in and sort that out is Eddie Howe. So I didn't come into the broadcast thinking that way, but I think having discussed it with you guys and looked at some of the comments, I'm still on the Eddie Howe bus. I'm not getting on the Roy Keane bus. I'm not getting on the Jack Ross bus. Eddie Howe all the way. So come on, Celtic, sort it out. Russell crashed it. Russell crashed the Keane bus. <laughs> the wheels have fallen off. I ah, know. Clear now to it. Aye, absolutely. Um, Gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure once again. It always is on a Thursday. Now, my mathematics will tell me that it'll be 96 days the next time I see you on this broadcast, JP. So I look forward to that. Thanks, everybody, for uh, getting involved. We aren't far off 11,000 subscribers on YouTube. Um, it might just be a figure to most, but we are trying to build that up because the more subscribers we have, the more daily viewers we have. It's all free. Um, over the last five weeks our broadcasts, not all Celtic related but our broadcasts on the channel um, have averaged 21 broadcasts a week for the last five weeks and we're going to build that up and build that up, all free of charge uh, Declan, tell us about your new show Yep, new show launches tonight, 8 o'clock uh, The State of Politics, we'll be chatting to journalists, politicians um, ex-MSPs, ex-MPs about all matters political myself and my, my mate Patrick so tune in at 8 o'clock tonight, we've got Fraser Stewart on from the University of Strathclyde where we're talking Brexit, we're talking uh, Scottish elections Alba Party, Alex Salmon, covered a lot so tune in Brilliant, I'm looking forward to it and also yet another Juno theme tune so you'll recognise Juno from the intro and outro to Axon yet another one, funky wee tune for the state of politics join us tonight, did you say 8 o'clock Declan? 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock tonight on our State of Mind YouTube channel thanks everybody for getting involved and we'll see you at 12.30 tomorrow 